This video is all about testing. So why do we test? Well, the main reason why we test our programs is to make sure that it does what it should do and it meets the needs of the end user. Um, and there are various reasons why a program might not function as it should. It could be that there's syntax errors making the program not run properly. Uh, it might be that there's some logic errors making the program produce some unexpected results. Or it might be errors in the overall design of the program that mean it doesn't do the job that it was supposed to do. And in all of these cases, there are different testing strategies that we need to carry out to ensure that these issues are eradicated, enabling the program to meet the needs of the end user. And the timings of these tests are really important. Testing should be ongoing throughout the development process. It should be iterative. Code um, an aspect of your program and test it before moving on. That is a, a real um, key part of development. You've got to be testing as you go along. And then, of course, at the end of your um, development process, you should do final testing. So when the program's complete, the program should be tested again as a whole against the requirements of the customer, ensuring that their needs have been met. So program errors. There are different types of errors that you need to know about for your GCSE, um, and we'll have a look at each one. So program errors, we've got three main types. We've got syntax errors, we've got logic errors, and we've got runtime errors. So with a syntax error, if you think about the fact that when you've written your code um, in maybe Python or C++, that code can't be understood by the CPU. The CPU only understands machine code, zeros and ones. So for it to be understood, a translator will translate your code into binary. And for the translator to be able to do that, the code has to be written according to the rules of the language. Otherwise, the translator won't be able to convert your code. So a syntax error is simply when you have an error where the code written doesn't meet the rules of the programming language. So the errors appear when the source code is translated. Translator tries to convert the code, but the code doesn't meet the rules known to the translator and an error occurs. So what types of syntax errors are there that we should be looking out for? Well, an incorrect assignment statement. So here you can see that it should be answer equals number one plus number two. Um, because obviously assignment is reversed, answer becomes num number one plus number two. Uh, missing extra punctuation, so it might be that in a print statement uh, you're missing a uh, speech mark. May be not enough arguments. Here we've got a function that's being called and we're passing a value, a, an argument, a parameter into the function called printer, but there are two that are expected. So that would cause an error that is not written according to the rules of the language. A missing part of a multi-line statement. So stating an if statement uh, or starting an if statement even, but failing to finish with an end if in some languages. Misspelling an identifier after it's already been declared. So for example, you create a variable called number one and you assign it with the value five and then later you misspell that variable. Uh, and a type mismatch, so the computer expects a certain data type but it receives another. So for example, you enter a number and it wants to convert it to an integer, but let's say that you typed in um, a string instead, it can't convert it and therefore throws up an error. So some IDEs have translated diagnostic and highlight potential syntax errors, and some might even correct them. But these can be erroneous in themselves, so programmers should always check first. So logic errors are another type of error. Now, logic error is where the code is written according to the language, but it still produces unexpected results, or the program itself, once it's been converted, when run, will produce unexpected results. And it's simply because there is an error in the logic of the program. It doesn't do what it should do. So a common logic error is an incorrect math statement. So for example, um, if a programmer wrote time divided by distance when calculating the speed, the program would output a value, but it'd be incorrect because speed equals distance over time. So these can be harder to spot because programs will actually compile and run. This is up to the programmer to spot when the outputs are not producing the expected outputs. So we need to test against expected results to ensure that the program is free of logic errors. 
Other types of lo logic error are wrongly ordered instructions, wrong conditions for an if statement or iterations. And then we've also got runtime errors and these are very difficult to spot. So when a code is free of syntax errors, so it's been written according to the rules of the language and compiles nicely, and it's free of logic errors, in other words, it still does exactly what it should do, you can still get some errors, uh, and these are called runtime errors. So these will occur in a normal working program if some extreme condition occurs. So for example, it might be that a program gets into a situation where it's to perform an arithmetic which has an impossible answer. For example, you may have a calculation and the user inputs um, a zero um, as the number that we're dividing by. And because we can't divide by zero, we get a runtime error. Or maybe finding the square root of a negative number. So in these situations, if the program has been given data um, which is not possible um, in the arithmetic, then a runtime error will occur. Other example runtime errors are overflow errors. So this is where a variable tries to hold a value that's too big for it. So an integer holds two bytes. So if a larger value is calculated and assigned to that variable, then you get an overflow error. Uh, a solution might be to round the answer, temporarily removing the zeros. It's less precise, but at least the number can be stored. And then those zeros can be added later, uh, either when displaying the answer or when carrying on with the calculation. A stack overflow error is another runtime error. So this is where stack space runs out, happens during recursion and library errors. So this may occur if your program hasn't imported the correct library or if the program tries to access a library that isn't present on the system. So we've had a look at a range of different errors. Now we'll have a look at some testing strategies, ways that we can test our programs to make sure that we eradicate the chance of any of these errors um, occurring. So black box testing. This is one strategy, and this only this is when you only deal with the inputs and outputs of the program. You don't worry about how the how the algorithms work. So, ideally, what we'd want to do is test every possible input and make sure that it produces every you know the expected results. Um, but it's not possible due to the massive combination of possible inputs you could have. Um, so, what we'll do is we'll just try to look at the overall functionality of the program and test um, each function. As, as well as we possibly can with some uh, typical data that the user would enter. Now that data could be uh, valid data, so typically acceptable uh, data. It could be borderline data, so let's say that the program was asking for uh, someone to enter their age. It might be that we have a, a, a limit, of, we validate that it's going to be between 0 and maybe 120, um, and we might do a borderline test to double check that um, a 0 and 120 would be accepted, but anything outside of that, uh, those boundaries would be rejected. And then we might also test with some invalid data. So for example, um, going along the same lines as the, uh, the age example, if someone entered 270, which isn't a possible, you know, it's not possible to be that old, um, then that would be a rejected um, by the system. So we just double check that invalid data would be um, handled correctly by the program. So another um, strategy is white box testing. So this is where we don't worry about the inputs and we don't worry about the outputs of the program. All we worry about is making sure that the algorithm itself functions correctly. So we focus on making sure that all possible paths of the algorithm work as they in were intended to. Um, so on each test, the path of the execution is noted and compared with other runs. Each path is determined by the values of the conditions in constructs, such as selection and iteration. Now, when it comes to black box testing, a test plan is often a really useful uh, method of doing that. So um, they ensure that systems are fully tested and they document all of the outcomes. Now, what a test plan is made up of is test data, the reason for the test, the expected outcome, and then the actual result, which we can then compare with the expected. Um, so we often will have some uh, success criteria for a program, and that success criteria, that's like the main functions that we expect our program to be able to perform, we would then perhaps do some tests to test each of those um, 
those functions, each of the success criteria. So here in the table, you can see that we've got our test numbers. We've got the reasons for the test. We're testing for valid data, borderline data, and invalid data. And we're documenting uh, what the uh, input data would be and what the expected results should be. So with regards to white box testing, where we're looking at just the algorithm and making sure that it functions as it should, what um, we can do, one strategy is to produce um, trace tables. We can do dry runs of the algorithm. So at times when errors aren't as obvious to spot, it can be helpful to go through the code manually, executing the code in your head and recording the effects of the various variables. This is a dry run and we use a trace table to document our results. So a trace table will have a column for the line of code to be executed. Um, a column for each variable affected and a column for any values outputted. Sometimes adding a column for the comments is useful. So consider this program here, this function that's going to accept um, 40 um, in the parameter n. So 40 is the argument being passed into the function. The first line a becomes 0 and b becomes 1 and then we enter a while loop. So what we do is we draw up a trace table which has got the iteration number, so we can trace this while loop. We got the values of A and B, columns for, for that. We got a column for the output, and we got a column for any comments that we want to make. So with the first iteration, A starts off at zero, B starts off at one. So I've written zero and one under A and B in that first row. So whilst A is less than N, well, N is 40, A is zero, so whilst that is true, we enter the loop and we print out A, which is why A is being outputted here. A then takes on B's value and B takes on A plus B's value. So if we think about that, then A will become 1 and B will become 0 plus 1. So it will stay as 1. So on the second loop, you can see here that A and B are both 1. So we're outputting A, so that's why 1 is being outputted here. Then A becomes what B was. Well, B was 1, so A continues to be 1. And B becomes 1 plus 1. A was 1, B was 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2. So then we, on the third iteration, you can see I've written down A as 1, B as 2. We've printed out A, so that's what's being outputted. This continues to go um, and loop around over and over. And you can see that I'm documenting the outputs and the values of A and B for each iteration. And at certain point, A will become larger than 40, and that's when the loop will end. So it says here, loop ends as on the next iteration, A will be greater than 40. So this is a dry run, an example of a dry run, and this is an example of using a trace table to document the dry run. Now, there is also acceptance testing. Remember that any program that's written, that you know, you're written it's written for a purpose. It's got to do um, some function, um, usually for an end user. So the previous tests have all been carried out to ensure that there's no bugs in the software, but acceptance testing takes place to ensure that the final product meets the needs of the user or the client. And this is where the program is tested against the requirements set out by the developers and the end users before the development process began. And alpha and beta testing are examples of this. So alpha testing is where we've done our black and white box testing. The program is pretty much um, finished. And then what we do is we just double check that it does what it should do by testing the program under um, everyday use. So usually it's done in-house, so it's done by the programmers. They're just going to now use the program as they would um, uh, anticipate an end user to use it. And they just want to do it to see whether there's any major flaws in the program. And they can quickly deal with that themselves because they're programmers. Then there's beta testing. So after the program's been alpha tested, there's often a beta release before it's released properly as a final product. Now you may well have heard of beta releases for certain programs, you get a free version, but there are probably a few shortcomings um, and it's given out to the masses. So certainly when they're developing Windows, there will be a developer version, which is a beta release just to, for, to allow people to install it on their systems, knowing full well that it's not gonna work perfectly, but they can have a little play around, they can see what this new modern version is going to look like and any errors that they come across, any shortcomings with the software, they can then report that back to the developers so that they can make those final changes um, before they release it properly to the public. So 
Often it involves large numbers of real users using the software under realistic conditions, often heavy duty demanding users. Last chance to find any bugs or shortcomings before it's released for the final product or as the final product.